So hello guys, I uh, hope you guys are all well and having a great week, uh, a great week of studies and also obviously the World Cup football. Tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering and Design Engineering. We're really excited to host the seventh talk in the annual guest lecture series. So this series runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings, bringing together a vibrant mix of speakers from across the full spectrum of design and engineering. A mix of leading practitioners, opinion leaders, radical thinkers and emerging talents to inspire and support your professional development. Tonight, we're delighted to host Greg Anderson, founder of Pharmacentric Solutions, where Greg delivers consultancy services for the pharma industry. So Pharmacentric Solutions specializes in device and packaging development and strategies from early concept development all the way through to commercial supply. Before this, Greg was also a senior design director as, at GSK, formerly GlaxoSmithKline, um, which is a British multinational pharmaceutical and biotechnology company. And Greg here was working as a device and packaging specialist. He has over 30 years of experience as a pharma and medical de um, device designer, and is also a named inventor and over 60 patents. Re a really exciting talk. And as usual, guys, feel free to gather your thoughts, your questions, your comments in the chat throughout the talk. We're also going to have a Q&A session at the end, and there's an, there's an option to go live and interact with Greg if you wish to. And over to Greg with the talk title, What's it really like being a designer in the life sciences? Lessons learnt and things I wish I'd known earlier. All yours, Greg. Okay, thanks very much for that. And let's just fire away. I've got, um, I'm not gonna go through this, you'll be glad to know, um, it's a bit, um, circle by circle, but it's just what I've done to try and map out, it was almost I had to remind myself what I've done over the years. So um, essentially, I have since what I started university in 1981, um, so I've, I've, I couldn't believe that I've been. Um, it's it's been 41 years since I started university, but this just it's it's my mind map. It kind of shows you where I've been, different jobs, um, and I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail. But it just kind of gives you this sort of vision, so you can see where I'm going to take you over the over the next hour. Um, so. As I say, I, I went to university um, in 1981 and I had a career primarily working in, in two companies. And um, I don't think that really happens anymore. I think most people job hop much more frequently. And what I've done in the middle here is I've just put in some of the things that I've worked on um, over the years, but it just gives you an idea of, of where I've been. And the other thing that I think is important, I didn't want to go through a long list of all the different um jobs that I held within one company but you can see there's the good thing about <clears throat> working certainly in GSK is that I did have a, a nice progression and it was essentially from research and development doing devices all the way around um, getting promoted different positions I moved into the manufacturing side of the business um, and, and actually picked up the responsibility for packaging for the, the whole of GSK um, and then finally, I've ended up setting up my own company. So a bit more detail about my journey. So uh, I was, what, 18 at the time, and I had to choose exactly what I was going to do course-wise. Industrial design was was not even known about. We, we had to kind of explain people what, what industrial design was. Um, it was a, a Bachelor of Science degree. Um, what was interesting about it, it was a sandwich course, thin sandwich. So in between second and third years, we had to um, get a job. Um, and that was part of our um, final year, you know, final course marking. So I had two six month spells working in industry, completely different. The first one was designing wooden toys, um, which was a lesson in itself. But I learned an awful lot about manufacturing. Um, I learned a lot about kids. Um, and for my second placement, I did uh, exhibition design uh, and ended up doing large exhibitions um, in Edinburgh during the festival. So again, that was great experience. And to be honest, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do during my course. Um, so it gave me an insight into what I didn't want to do. So the, the great thing about the, the new course, it was only in its fourth year. Um, but it had a good technology bias. We had a good, you know, we were we were a really heavy bias actually on engineering and design. We didn't actually get near doing any design until pretty much the end of the first year. 
Um, the, the, the key thing that we did was a major final year project. We were given six months to do this. Um, we were a class, we started off as 32 and we ended up as 12. This was in the days when if you, if you didn't make the grade, they kicked you out. So it was quite intensive. And we all went away and chose our final year subject or topic to do our design on. And I actually ended up doing something that I hadn't normally done. I did want to actually, mountain bikes were just starting to come out. And I thought, I'm going to go and look at, you know, understanding doing a mountain bike. But it was pointed out to me um, that maybe what I should do is something that there's a real need for. So I went around asking people that I'd come across you know, when I was at university, what the gap in the market was. And we, I identified that there was a, a real gap in the market for um, an intravenous bag being um, pumped, because normally what used to happen is that in emergency situations, you'd need someone to literally stand there and hold it. So I developed a peristaltic pump um, and it, it had a, a quite... A, unusual at the time because obviously we couldn't rely on things like batteries so we incorporated a, a clockwork mechanism into it so we had to design and, and build a, a rig and because it's a bsc course we had to really look to make sure that it was a viable proposition but the learning for me was i, I obviously knew nothing about emergency response what's required in in accident situations so i spent an inordinate amount of time actually with doctors learning what the problem was more about the problem and they kind of helped me develop the brief and, and it was a really good uh, insight into not only their needs but also the design opportunity itself so i designed something um when i look at it now it's it, you know we had to build models and everything i mean that was a great thing these are proper no there was no cad in these days it was all pen and paper that model is actually built from from mdf um my most embarrassing moment um in my final year is that i went to a supplier um who had um wanted to see it because i, I you know, built the model by then and uh, we were sitting in this conference room. There was about 20 people around the table. I did my talk and then he asked me to switch it on. And I had to explain to him that it was actually made of MDF. But it was it was great and it got put into the, the, the degree show. I got a lot of positive feedback. And then what I decided to do was when I left uni, um, I decided to do a, a year's course in, in marketing and more to learn how to sell the actual fusion pump concept but at the end of the day, you know, if you're a designer, you've got to learn how to sell your designs. So again, this was quite useful and it, and it was a great course. Um, and I would encourage, you know, if you are doing design, get to know the commercial guys because they're the ones who can actually A, give you work, but B, you know, sign it off. Um, so the commercial teams are important. Um, so with that infusion pump, um, I did actually manage, I went to a company, we presented it and it was fantastic because they actually turned around and offered me a job and it was a company that actually makes surgical and anesthetic equipment um i was the first sort of product designer that, that they'd actually taken on and it was a, a fantastic opportunity because you know they had the factory downstairs they had the engineering and design and regulatory and clinical upstairs but you were literally designing stuff and you could go downstairs and have it made um now obviously i'm not a doctor so i spent an, an awful lot of time with um surgeons and anesthetists and i was kind of using the lessons that i'd learned from that final year project so i used to have to go to operations and, and watch them and i'm the kind of guy if i i feel sick if i got a fish but after two three years of going to to operations you know i really got to understand the issues and how to how to design the problems but working with the clinicians you know we we optimized our designs we improved them the good thing about making these products is that they were all pretty much um home you know not homemade they were made in the factory by hand um until they got to a certain scale up point and then we would look to automate some of the manufacture but it was a, a fantastic learning curve and again working with doctors 
designing things that I was never ever going to use was was a great opportunity. And again, another lesson that I learned: clinicians they they have got so many great ideas, and you know that synergy between us being designers and makers, but also them you know clinically getting involved, um, you know, so so you could see what you'd made in operations and then constantly enhancing them, freezing the design, and then you'd launch it. And, and a project typically would be six months to a year. So it was, it was you know, quite a quick turnaround of projects. So from, from Portex, I stayed there about three years. Um, main reason I moved was because um, it was one of my mates <laughs> said, uh, we are working, I'm working on this small design team at a company called Glaxo. Why don't you, you come and have a look? Um, I was getting at a point where I think that certainly at Portex, I was becoming an expert, you know, within the three years I'd been there. And I thought I really do need to maybe open up my, my experience. So this was a great opportunity. And obviously moving to a company where I knew, um, you know, one of the guys that was working there. So it was a small in-house team in those days. Um, it was 1989, uh, you know, pharma companies didn't have device departments. They didn't really have devices. And what ones they did have, they were either buying them in or they were sort of super engineered. Um, I wouldn't call them designed. They were, they were more engineered. So I started working on this project. It was called Discus. Um, it was a new inhaler. Um, that it had already been patented. So I was brought in to, to, to do some of the drawing work, to do some of the late um, human factors testing. It was, we called it ergonomics then. Um, but, but, you know, we were, we, we were really in a position where it was very novel, We'd, we, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but it was quite an unusual device at the time, um, again, working with the commercial teams, the clinical teams, and we had to come up with a new packaging method as well. So I worked on that, I got more involved with other programs were going, that were going along, so we were looking at things like, you know, what are, what's the future of inhalation? Um, and I was given a brilliant project um, by the commercial guys because it was pointed out that, you know, we make medicines not for countries, we make medicines for, for global needs. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, we are sitting in a, an office in London and we're not going out and understanding our patients maybe as much as we should. So I was given a brief, go away and come back with, a list of needs from different countries around the world so that we can actually narrow this down to you know different platform devices and the reason that they wanted and were prepared to invest is because to develop a drug you, nowadays you're looking at around about a, a billion dollars to develop a device that goes along with it it's hundreds of millions of pounds um, and the thing is is that the two obviously have to go together so an inhaler like discus it's got the drug in it um, and you use that for the month um, and, and then that's that. So the, and, and the drug is, is essentially um, fixed into the device. And if you get involved in the industry, it's known as a combination device. So we did this voice to the customer study. Um, we, we ended up with re loads of things that we didn't know. Um, things that, we, you know, you know, the obvious stuff, but the word latent, you know, these, these, these things, I wish I'd known that. <laughs> or why didn't we think about this? We had a long list of them and it enabled us to actually really put forward very in-depth and exciting briefs. And, and my lesson is that if you get the research right, it really does, it's 80% of your design solution is getting that brief right and spending the time up front. Um, so so GS, Glaxo moved to become Glaxo Welcome which became GSK. My only lesson there is that I didn't expect to spend much time there, maybe three years, but I actually ended up spending 28 years there. But, but the company actually, you know, was, was merged three times. So if you do join companies, be prepared for that. It shouldn't bother you, but it, you know, this is what happens in companies. Nothing stands still um, in, in, in pharma or, or industry. So I, I moved, I got as far as becoming the design uh, device design director in research and development. And uh, I then moved, it was a 
promotion essentially to become the head of technical packaging. Um, I hadn't really been very heavily involved in packaging, but, but the one lesson that I learned in that move is that everything needs packaged um, and it doesn't matter what it is. And there's always problems and issues with packaging. Um, a lot of it's a little bit faster moving. Bear in mind that to develop a device in pharma, you're talking five to eight years, you're working on that project and you run along with the, the drug development. Uh, it used to be that packaging was thought about at the end, um, not anymore. Packaging is fully integrated into the device development. And it's a whole new area for, I think, if, you, if you're involved in the design industry, it's fast moving, it's really exciting, and it's very challenging, and it's, it's always evolving. Um, so a little bit more about um, my experiences. So, you know, reflecting back, you can put a great medicine in a mediocre device. And the one thing that we learned from developing the, um, the discus, which you can see here on the, on the right, um, we actually learned that if you put a great medicine into a great device, it, it really does um, help um, with, with the commercial side and it differentiates from, from the competition. And at the end of the day, we should be making devices that are easy for patients to use. And, and that, that was a key lesson for me. Um, you know, you, you'll hear about this patient -cent centric design and, and, you know, knowing your customer. And I think it's a lesson for any designer. And it really doesn't matter what you're designing to know and understand the needs of the, the user and, and really building that solid brief is absolutely key. The other thing I learned about is the patents. You know, we, we just, we, we obviously patented stuff as we went along, but you know, these things, they last for 20 years. Um, they, they are important. And I think it's a measure of also your creativity. Um, I, I, you know, we never did anything alone. We did, we did a couple of patents by ourselves, but we worked as a creative team. And, and the good thing about it is that when you do your patent, that's always recognized. Um, so, so again, I would strongly advise you to learn about patents and intellectual property, because it's kind of, it's one of the ways that you measure your creativity. Um, other things that I've done through the years within pharma, um, the good thing is, is that I have actually been able to um, understand and overcome these regulatory and technical hurdles that you get thrown at you. So you do actually have to understand about regulations. You do have to understand about manufacturing because, you know, there's no point coming up with something that you can't make. So doing that and understanding it, I think, is key. And um, the other thing, as I say, is learning about different diseases. Each of the disease areas that we moved into, they're all different. Um, and, you know, CNS is central nervous system. So that's things like migraine. If someone has a migraine, their eyesight is affected. So, you know, again, you've got to try and design around that, make sure that it's much more tactile. Um, so, so, again, research, research, research. And I can't emphasize the importance that a designer should do this. And I was never taught that at university. And, and I think it's the sort of thing that, you know, my lesson is that the more you learn upfront about what your, your topic is, the better solution that you're going to come across and it doesn't matter what it is and then the other thing is is that obviously it's not just about the device you know just the way that patient instruction leaflets we actually design our devices thinking about what the actual instruction leaflet is going to look like so in the instruction leaflet for example we might say pull a lever across until it clicks and we would design in a click into the device so that it, it ensures that the patient knows that they've pushed a lever um, to the right position. It's almost like the kicks and clicks on your keyboard, you know, on your phone, the reason it clicks, there's, there's not a mechanical click on there, it's a digital click, but it's reassurance. And, and again, this is why it's really important that you start thinking about this. We learn about not only, as I say, about the device, but how it's packaged. So this product, um, that's, that's, kind of exploded here it's in actually instead of putting it in, a, in an overwrap we've actually put it in a preformed aluminium tray it was affectionately known as the cat food tray um, because that's the technology that that we we kind of learned from 
but that enhances the shelf life. And the advantage of enhancing the shelf life is that you don't have to write off stock if it goes out of date because pharma products very often have to last two to three years. And this packaging solution actually offered really a, a strongly enhanced shelf life. And then the other thing is training devices. If you've got a new device, think about how it's going to be trained. So we actually offer very simple giveaways um, that, that doctors can use. So instead of giving doctors crappy pens with your company name on it, we actually made training devices that, that physicians could, could give to their patients so they could learn how to use the device. Um, other things that I built on, don't just think about medicines being in, in the Western world. We spend a lot of time, and again, this is because global medicines are global. Um, so we spent, again, time looking at emerging markets. Um, again, people very often, most of the world is not paid every day. So how do you pay for your medicine? You know, we are very lucky. We have the National Health Service. There's no National Health Service in America, the greatest land in the world. Um, so, you know, literally people are paid, most of the world is paid by the day. So if they're going to manage their disease. So what we looked at doing was coming up with um, solutions that that would that would be of absolute quality rigor but they they would be affordable so this was a, a spacer device to allow users of um ventolin products um spaces are normally actually quite expensive but we had a, a, a target price here of it, it was called we called it the dollar project the dollar spacer project and it kind of let our suppliers know what our target price was and that, that strategically worked. And another thing we did is we took actually an old drug and we repurposed it. Um, and all we did was because in some countries, if you actually have a respiratory disease, your employer won't employ you because he thinks that you, you, you might be off sick. So instead of having a, something that looks like a medicine, we actually just made a very simple box that held the device. Um, and, and these are unit doses, so they could buy these literally by the day. Um, and it was very discreet, but the advantage of it is we incorporated things like the instructions on how to use it inside. So again, simple, free um, attributes, but it enables you to, to, to market a product at a price point. And again, I think this is important. Don't just think of pharma as, um, you know, expensive medicines. There's, there's an awful lot of um, people in the world that need good medicines, reliable medicines. And, and there's so many counterfeits. So again, having them have original products is key. Um, other things that oh, other things that I've had an opportunity to do, um, I sit on the Packaging Society, which is part of the Institute of Materials. Um, the reason that's important is that, you know, obviously, all of our packaging has to be made of materials and, and it's an opportunity to represent pharma. So, oh, sorry. If you go, uh, if you do get involved in, in the packaging side of, of the business, um, knowing about these societies that you can join, it doesn't cost you very much, but it's a great way of building a network. I headed up um, a, a group called the Medicine Manufacturing Industry Partnership. My, my accountability there was um, looking at technology and innovation in, in the UK for the, for the UK pharma industry. And um, when I was there, I, I had an, and this is whilst I was at GSK, I had the opportunity to write the, um, the, the, the roadmap for the industry um, looking forward. And again, that was a great experience. Never trained to do it, but it, it, was, it was a good learning curve for me. And then the other opportunities that I've been given, kind of leveraging on what we've done on exit, access to medicine, is that we, we, we do this on a pro bono, it's free, um, and the company encourages us to go and work with um, Bill and Melinda Gates, Save the Children, but we actually use our skills to come up with um, you know, design solutions. And Umber Pro is a GSK project, we make it at cost but it's for um, umbilical cords in, in emerging markets. When kids are first born, um, you'd be surprised at how many children die just because they haven't got a simple um, disinfectant um, on, on the uh, umbilical cord when it's cut. Um, and GSK 
made this product is actually made from um, one of our toothpaste mouthwashes because it's essentially an antiseptic um, and it's it's condensed down and we did a very quick project we packaged it in the world health organization um, was essentially took it from gsk but again it's, it's gsk if you do any research on it every year they win the access to medicines um, awards because they, they they give away a lot of medicines and that was I, to be honest i was really proud of that um so what's it like working in a big pharma company? Um, I did find it a bit daunting at first. So my first job, there was 900 people there. There's 100,000 people in, um, in, in, in GSK. And a lot of pharma companies are very big. But the opportunity was that I could move from pharma to the consumer healthcare side of the business. Now, that has actually just been spun off. Um, but it was great learning about, you know, things like toothpastes and and uh, we made some nasal products. We made lots of different, um, you know, the headache, micro, headache tablets. It was, it was interesting just moving from something that development times take, you know, five to eight years. And in consumer healthcare, it's a much shorter um, design time. And again, it's building on brands. So I even worked on Horlicks and Lucozaid because we had those brands in those days. Um, it's a great industry. It, it, it's one that I didn't think about. I must admit, when I was at university, but you know, you, you do get a sense. You start realizing the volumes that you talk about. You know, you start off doing your clinical trials, small volumes, testing on 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 you know in the clinic, and then it is hundreds of millions. So so it's that sense of scale. I think was 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 an insight to me. Um, what else is good about big companies? Network. It's, it's a great place to meet so many people. I've met hundreds and hundreds of people in the business, all across the business. There's opportunity. I mean, the only thing I would say is that it's a pharma company. They don't do design. Um, I could only go so far. And that's one of the reasons that I left. Um, but I spent, it took me 28 years to, to get to the point where I wanted to leave. Um, and, and there is real careers uh, within these companies. And don't forget, there's lots of manufacturing. So if you've got a design skill, you can take that skill and move it around a business, especially if there's 100,000 people in it. And, you know, the, the company never stayed still. It, it merged, it sold stuff, it bought stuff. And it was really interesting seeing that evolution. Um, what, what was bad? Um, the problem with 100,000 people, you're a very small cog um, in a very large machine. And and I don't know if that bothers you, then don't work for a big company. But um, it didn't bother me at all. And, and what, what's more important is what you bring to the party and your relationship with, with people and the delivering of, of expectations. Um, I did really like working and learning about the customers and getting to spend time with, with patients. And, and that was, you know, kind of, again, an honor, really. Um, I did spend time, the bottom two pictures there, one of the projects I did a bit later on was with uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So I actually, I'd never been to Africa, but I got to spend nearly three months there. Um, going to Africa is huge. <laughs> I didn't realize how big it was, but it was fascinating just seeing and understanding the needs um, within these within the regions and how each country is different. And as a designer, you know, you could see your stuff. I mean, that image on the left-hand side is, is a pharmacy, you know, it's pretty crude. I mean, you wouldn't believe the temperature in that pharmacy. So you start to understand how stuff's stored and, and the reality of it. And this is where essentially people live, you know, um, this was in South Africa, um, but it was, again an amazing insight and i got to speak to real people and that made a massive difference and when you sat no you don't design stuff sat at a desk you know you have to know and get out and and again this was a great opportunity and that's you know that's where pharma can, can give you this um things i should have done i wish i'd probably done i've got three kids in the 20s now i, I wish i had gone abroad earlier i moved from scotland I moved 400 miles um, to, to get that first job. Sometimes I wish I'd gone a bit further. I wish I'd learned a language. Um, the good thing about you know design is you can take your skills pretty much anywhere. 
Um, other things that I wish I'd done, some of my mates moved abroad and um, I went to visit some of them in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, which was great. But I had friends that moved to Australia and I wish I'd gone to visit them. Um, so if, if, if you're a peer group move, you know, follow them. Um, and go visit them because it's free accommodation and they'll show you the town and obviously they can they can come and stay with you when they come back to the UK. Um, I, I, we didn't have the technology that you guys have got now, so you can work from anywhere. Um, the language definitely, um, I, you know, if you, do, if you build on your language skills, you can double your employment um, opportunities. And I've had friends that have moved to Italy and, you know, and, and they're still there. And, and, you know, the key thing there is that I, I was probably a little bit too safe and, and the opportunity now you have, it's much bigger. And, and I would say, do it when you're young, when you can, yeah, before you get tied down. Other things um read more I, i'm terrible i don't read much i read factual stuff and i read what i need to read and what i should have done maybe is read a bit more extensively learn things that i didn't didn't know because everything that i've subsequently picked up i've been able to reuse um and reconfigure and that does make a difference i should have picked up cad i mean it was really early days when i did it and and i got as good as i needed to to be but I should have probably done it a little bit, but I still stuck with sketching. But I would say learn to sketch and use CAD. Sketching is still a pretty good thing to do. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I'm an innovator. I'm not, I'm not there to do CAD, but I have to share my, what's in my head. So, so really push and get on top of the tech. Um, I focused on devices. I should have gone into packaging a lot earlier um, because there's so much opportunity there. And obviously, you know, you, there's areas you didn't touch because of graphic designers, but you start thinking, well, I can pick this up and then you can actually offer the whole package. Um, so that's something that makes you a bit more valuable. Use your business card more. You know, honestly, I don't know if people do business cards anymore, but seriously, if you've got a job working for a company, use your business card. It's an absolute lever to build um, your network. It gets you, you know, into suppliers. The minute you go and see how stuff's made, you learn more and more. And I would really, really encourage that. Um, hand it out. Get it as business cards are cheap as chips. Get out, use it, leverage it, and don't forget. If you work for a company, your suppliers are hungry to get you engaged because you're you're a customer. Um, networking. I mean, obviously, you've got LinkedIn. Um, uh, the, the bigger your network, the more chance that you'll hear about jobs, the more chance that you'll have a, an opportunity. Um, you, you have to get out. And that's why I think, you know, you guys have had, you know, at the tail end of COVID, which was a nightmare. But get back out. Go to exhibitions that you might not even think about because you'd be surprised at how much you go to an exhibition, you see something, you go, oh, that's interesting. And as a designer, you know, you, you, your eyes should be open all the time and then publish I, I i was terrible at publishing stuff um but again more recently i've learned that you know that a lot of searches are done on published items so if you've got something you're learning about and you're good at don't be frightened to publish it doesn't cost you anything um and especially if you get really specialist in something do publish um top tips uh get known before you leave uni i mean this is you know, get, don't don't wait until you it's your last day at uni before you start looking for jobs. Get out there, do a summer job. If you know the, the people are looking for grads, even if you have to do it for nothing, um, and and that can it's on your CV. And I would really say do that. And and that thing there, every minute you're not learning, someone else's. I we had a very competitive year. And every time someone came back, you know, from a, a job that they'd done on the sandwich course, they knew that bit more and you'd lean over their shoulder and you'd think, oh God, I've got to catch up with them. Design competitions are great. Um, GSK did used to sponsor the RSA. I love it. It's a great competition. Um, and it's good. It's good practice. If you have to do it, a self-funded one, you know, that, that you do it. 
Um, we had guys, there's a guy who won in our year and he's, he's one of the um, top designers at Apple um, and his placement was at Moogridge Associates, which did very early work for Apple. So, you know, it, it really does make a difference. And don't go for money, go for the job experience. Um, I've gone on about finding out the, the real needs of the, the, the customer. Uh, it is listening and, and watching fundamental skill. Um, I think that you should um, look to, obviously, you know, when you listen to your, your your customer, it's your job then to turn that that need into a solution. Don't go straight to solution. Find the need first. Do always think about the potential to patent. Um, it is, I think, the ultimate proof of innovation. If you've got something you think is a good idea, don't put it up at your final year show because the minute you put it up on the boards, the you lose the intellectual property because you put it in the public domain. And then lastly here, learn everything about manufacturing that you can, um, because if you're a designer, it has to be made. And, and that's where I can't emphasize enough, get into factories. Other things, um, don't waste time at uni. I wouldn't even go on social media. Um, and that's not me just shouting at my kids here. This is use every minute that you have and do learn from the people around you. And um, that is absolutely key as well. Um, and, and you know you're going to be friends for life, hopefully, and and the, you know learn and, and work together, especially if you have to work in teams on projects. I think that there's obviously so much competition now. I think it's much tougher for you than it was for us. Um, so you know you you got to really raise your game. That final year project, I don't know how long you spend on it. We had to spend six months on it. Six months. It's like almost being paid 15, 20 grand. So if you're going to spend six months of your life on something, choose the right one. Yeah, Think of it as a future. It's your business card for your next job, your first job. Um, learn how things made, absolutely fundamental. Learn about standards. They're not sexy, but you've got to learn about standards. You've got to learn about quality, regulations. And that's because no matter what you make, every industry has them. And then finally, do a fun project, you know, you, you've got the big ones, you've got the RS, um, the RSA one, you've got your final year project, do something fun, you know, it's just that you can throw up um, on the day, you know, <laughs> surprise your, your peer group, um, but do do something that's just a bit that, that you can relax and have a bit of fun about. In work, so this is you moved away from uni, uh, manufacturing or consultancy, I'd, I'd say, do both, try both. Um, consultancy is hard. Um, it's, it's a young person's game really. Um, but I think you have to maybe get experience in both. And don't forget a lot of manufacturers use consultancy. So having worked in consultancy, it's best knowing all the, all the top tricks that, 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 that consultancy use. But whatever you do, when you're young, put in the hours, um, don't care about nine to five, the more you can pick up in those early years, the, the, the stronger you're going to be. Build those skills around making. Again, it's like, you know, the, the more you know how to put something together, the smarter you're going to be, the more employable you are. Um, presentation skills, you're going to have to do presentations, I'm afraid. Um, if you've designed something, you've got to share it. You've got to be excited and passionate about it. So you've got to do that. You've got to learn. Project management skills, definitely. Um, you're going to have to manage projects. So, so knowing about this is, is key. People aren't going to do that for you. Um, when I went to GSK, I obviously didn't learn, get to know 100,000 people. But I got to know as many people as I could in as short a time as possible. Because the faster you get to know people, the more you know who to go to when you don't know something. Um, learn to influence and learn to educate and, and, you know, excite using design. You know, if you're not excited about your design, who else is going to be? So you, you do have to be really passionate about it. Obviously, I keep pushing, you know, look at the world. Um, keep those eyes open. First job, keep them open, keep them open. Never stop doing that because, you know, you, you're essentially a huge sponge. And the, the beauty is, is that, 
everything that you learn one day will be useful on the project. Um, another thing is don't you don't. I've seen people who who do design courses and say, "I'm going to be a designer." I, I personally believe that you're being taught to be creative, and I've seen people move into marketing jobs, even procurement jobs, a wide range of jobs. I think what's more important is you learn to use the skills that you learn as a designer, and and you can apply that to different industries. So don't necessarily think that you're going to end up being, you know, Philip Stark, you know, because because it, it doesn't there's too many of them in the world but i think that we have to use the skills that you've got and lastly here i've got ask for feedback <laughs> you know it's good and it's bad okay um but the sooner you get feedback whether positive or negative the better it is okay and then the last thing i've got in here is that you know i'm doing this because i do think you should put something back and i think everyone should be putting something back you know, when you've got these skills and you've got the capability, I think it is absolutely key to do that. Um, what have I done after, oh, here we go, after leaving GSK, uh, I, you know, I had an opportunity to step away. Um, I've decided to, you know, stay within the industry and use the knowledge that I've got. I am having a lot more fun because <clears throat> uh, I'm not told to want to do anymore. Um, I can say yes and no, which is great. I think the minute that I'm not relevant, I, I step away. Um, my wife's told me this, you know, like the minute you're, you're off outdated. But, but the lesson I've learned is the minute that you stop on that, that I don't want to call it a merry-go-round, but life is a merry-go-round. Getting back on is, is difficult. So that's where, you know, I feel quite passionate about staying within the industry because I've got so much in my head and knowledge and that's enabled me to do things that I feel much more interested in now. So my focus is on sustainability and pharma. Um, I don't care what I say anymore and that's a valuable tool um, and it's key. And then the other thing that I'm, I get excited about is small innovators that I've, I've connected with and I, I basically help them out. And it's great fun and it's really interesting. And I do wish I'd actually started doing this earlier, um, but I do think that you need at least 10 years experience before you can actually have the commitment to do this. So I'm just gonna give you some really quick case studies. So I talked about Discus. This is a project that, as I say, to, had started when I joined the department and it kind of made our department and, and really grew us as, as a team. Um, but you know, this is the sort of stuff that we were doing. It was quite technical, but we were a group of designers, design engineers, and it was proper sketches in those days, magic markers. But you know, we quickly moved from sketches to models. Um, this was the aha moment. Um, we 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 were looking at a way of dispensing a month's therapy. How can you do it? And we came up. We essentially. We were looking at films and cameras. <laughs> we don't have these anymore. We've got digital cameras, but we kind of piggybacked on the technology. And, and this is what I mean. Go and you know look at how things are done differently and see if you can, can leverage that. And this is some of the really crappy sketches actually that we were doing, but this is how we actually ended up evolving the device. And it was great because we, we, you know, you probably couldn't brand that now because of the name's probably gone, but we, we did. And it's still in production, you know, we've won a bucket load of awards. This is still being made in its millions. You know, we were over hundred million a year. It, the, the, the sales on the company um, were, were big. <laughs> the only thing that I had noticed in the news today, this is the site where it was developed and made. Some of that site has actually been just sold off today. So it just shows you how much industry changes. And I've got two very quick case studies here. Another one, this is looking at access. This is some of the stuff that um, I actually picked up from um, not only Africa, but in the Philippines as well. So we had this product in the Philippines, but the other project that we did was around people taking antibiotics and they, they stopped taking them after about the second or third day. Uh, and, and that's bad. You have to actually take your antibiotics for the full three days because what was happening is they were feeling better. 
So we did originally have just these three lines here. It kind of just showed them, you know, morning, evening, morning, evening. You can't expect everyone to read. But, but the final bit that we learn is that when the doctors or the nurses are explaining it or the pharmacies, they actually talk about the, the bugs. <laughs> um, and, and if, you know, if you still take, if you, if you stop taking your tablets, the bugs will still be there. And it was just the way we, we kind of evolved this instruction leaflet. And this was literally stamped on a paper bag that they dropped the antibiotics into. And again, this is where we actually learned to, to evolve and move with simple solutions. It's not necessarily all high tech. And then the last one, this is a project I got involved with. The company's called Cola Life, um, run by a lovely guy who, he, he wanted a diarrhea kit that you could, um, you know, you could use it in, it was in all remote areas in Africa. The biggest problem that he had was putting a kit together and then shipping it um, because the, the most difficult and most expensive part was, was getting it out to these remote areas. So he managed to, he developed the pack and he knew what bits he needed. And what he actually did was he designed the pack such that it actually fitted in between bottles um, on a crate of Coca-Cola. Because there's a, an adage in Africa, you can get a, a cigarette and a Coca-Cola anywhere in Africa. And this is what he did. And he didn't tell Coca-Cola they were doing, <laughs> he was doing this. And he actually went to the factories where they were filling the Coke in Africa, because it's packed locally. Um, and he, he basically just got them to use the space in between, um, gave them a small amount of money. Coca-Cola picked up on this and they were put into a position where they had to say <laughs> that it was that they were endorsing it. And, and again, the reason that I love this, uh, the Simon's the guy who runs the company, is he doesn't give a monkeys. Yeah. And, and he found a solution. He packed this literally on crude machines. And this is where I think it's a mixture between, you know, how packaging can make a massive difference. And he actually used the packaging um, to, 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 to make the measuring cups so you can get the mix right. And, and again, I did not get involved in this, but it's an example of something that I did actually end up technically helping them, but he's the guy who thought of the idea, but it's, genius and this is why it it's the creativity that you need to be looking at when when given a challenge that i believe is it amazing amazing gregor is fan, a fantastic talk fascinating uh, your journey and obviously great case studies there as well that you end on the, the discus the philippines bento the uh, yamoyo as well and uh, great um, advice and tips for students, both like in terms of their studies, being a student, alongside obviously reflections in terms of what you wish you had done earlier as well, alongside tips for transitioning from uh, studies into industry and in going into work and consultancy or manufacturing. A, fa a fascinating talk. As usual, guys, uh, feel free to continue to gather your thoughts, your questions and comments in the chat. Um, I can see a few coming through already. So, Please. yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Happened. That's all right, that's all right. No problem at all. Um, yeah, the first question coming through from Leila. Um, uh, is... No, you don't, honestly. Um, and, and, you know, you've got to start somewhere, okay? <laughs> so my son, he did an engineering degree. He's just done 18 months in a consultancy, and he's, he's got himself a job um, do, doing device design. And, and, you know, his medical experience is, is, is negligible. He did have a kidney taken out, so he knows a bit about hospitals. But... You know, the bottom line is no, to start with no. And then as you, again, that's why you've got to quickly learn. Um, but the faster you learn, the more employable and valuable you are. So, and you can't know everything. And the good thing is, is that doctors don't know anything about design or engineering. So that's the synergy that you can really, really bring together. They need you as much as you need them. 100%. And uh, that was Greg's response to Layla's question in terms of do you need a background knowledge in terms of medicine or healthcare if you wanted to pursue a career in uh, pharma pharmaceuticals or consume healthcare? Um, Tony's also asking, uh, do you think that your, des your design skills or your skills in industrial design translated well into the pharma industry? 
or did you have to uh, do a lot of learning that you, you, you no because i'll tell you why because you know, when you do a design course you know in theory you could be i could be designing a lawnmower one day and a, and, and a radiator the next and that's the mentality that i think that you've got to go in there saying okay i know nothing about this i've got to accelerate my learning now this is this is more i mean this is what happens in consultancies because consultancies some of them, many consultancies are now specializing okay so you get companies like i don't know team pa some of the big boys um ppd you know they're specializing in in pharma medical devices i mean the good thing is it's quite a secure industry because people are always ill um so so it's recession proof as such so so you yes my my skills absolutely because you're taught how to think you're taught how to brainstorm you're taught how to understand you, you know engineering um solutions from problems what you're probably not taught enough is how to do that research and why it's absolutely vital i mean i know that we did I mean, again, my course was over 40 years ago, and I think you guys are much more forward looking at, you know, human factors and we, we did literally ergonomics half an hour a week in our final year. And the most important thing I think in design is, is getting the ergonomics right. So, so, you know, that's where, yes, they do translate definitely. And, and this is what I meant, the skills that you're learning now, I think, you, you know, you guys, you can go into many different fields, you, you could go into computing, you could go into setting up your, you know, setting up your own business, if you want, not necessarily doing um, design work, because I think <laughs> that's, that's far too uh, much of a, a step um, too early. But, but, you know, you've got that you can think creatively and it's how you look and approach things, I think, is, is the way that you're taught at uni now. And, and that's really good. Amazing. And uh, beyond the, the discus, I mean, which was your first project when you were at um, Glaxo and Glaxo GSK, um, uh, are there any other favourites that come to mind in terms of uh, product development or R&D that you, you worked at, at at the time? Sorry, say that again. <laughs> I said, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the projects that you worked on whilst you were at Glaxo or GSK, um, the, you know, the Discus obviously is a, is a really interesting case study there, and it was one of the first ones that you worked on. Do you have any other favourites um, in terms of either projects or patents? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I did, um, the, the, there was Discus, we, we actually, you don't, you know, the minute you finish doing it, you start looking at what your next project is. So I did nasal devices. I mean, that was a really interesting one because... You, nasal devices were really rubbish <laughs> um, and go and go and look at it on the web but we we did a, a, a product called Avamis um, which was a really good insight into you know the, the, the nasal route which is quite exciting um, what other things I've done other inhalers I've done um, a counter we put a counter onto the puffers um, it's used in some products in the in the in the in Europe, but it's used on all inhalers in, in America. Um, have, the puffers have to have a counter on them now. And that was the early 2000s I did that. Um, obviously, the Bill and Melinda Gates, we did projects looking at um, devices for postpartum. Um, uh, that was a medical device that we kind of sponsored and worked with. What other patents? Packaging patents, that cat food tray, you wouldn't believe that's that, that we got a patent on that. So there's, there's loads of different projects. And the good thing is, is that although projects do last a long time, you, you get to hop around on, on your colleagues' projects, you know, because they'll say, look, we're doing a brainstorm, we've got a problem, come and join us. Mm -hmm. So so again, that was a great insight. And then going back to the, the consumer healthcare stuff, you know, toothpastes, you know, you, in toothpaste packaging and moving into that, even simple things like um, uh, Lucozade. Um, we, we had a project on Lucozade and we actually ended up making them, um, uh, the, the bottles, Lucozade were one of the first products that used fully recyclable bottles um in all in, in all their products. So we had a project where we had to go and try and find out where to get um, plastic from <laughs> um, because getting recycled recycle it PET was really difficult 
So again, that was like a week's project. And, and our aha moment was we were working around one of the sites one day and we realized that we actually get supplied um, a lot of our sub-assemblies in PET trays that we then were paying a company to dispose of. Um, and, you know, suddenly you, you realize that you, you could use your waste materials in those Lucozade bottles. Amazing. Amazing. And a few questions come in here, talking more about your, your time at university and, and advices as, as a student alongside your final year project. Irene's question is, um, I, I guess you picked up on something that you mentioned about the, the your final major project, the, the projects in the last year. And you must have mentioned something about being careful in terms of what you do or so, so forth. So she was asking you to elaborate a little on. In yeah, terms OK, I, I, I get the question now. I was reading it. I was thinking, oh, uh, I was never careful at university. Um, <laughs> Okay, where you have to be careful, because you're going to spend, you do a final year project, don't you? Yeah, definitely. How long do you spend on it? It's around, uh, yeah, it's around, it's, it's a full academic year, so a good around six, seven months. Okay, so if you were in consultancy and you were getting paid to do that, you would charge out 50, 60 grand, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so you're now going to spend six, eight months of your life doing something. The worst thing is, is that you choose a project that no one's really interested in, um, uh, or, or you do a project that, you know, the, the mountain bike one was interesting because we had two guys on our course and then we went down to new designers or some something. I think it was new designers. We were one of the very first um, cohorts that went down. I don't think it was called new designers in those days, but there was about eight people had decided to design the, the same thing. And it was a bit, it was a bit self-satisfying you weren't you, you should be using your final year project if you want to get into an industry and if you want to make a difference choose a really interesting brief that can help you leverage that first job you know that someone will go do you know what there's a massive gap in the market here and, and you've just you know part filled it and and you know coming up on the mountain bike is not going to get you a job they might get you a job at Specialized, but you're going to be in amongst another, you know, 15 people. Um, so, and, and it's back down to, you're going to have to expend a vast amount of your time and energy and effort. So I've got a friend whose son's just done his, and it was great. It was a wheelchair, um, a, a folding wheelchair that uh, he was at Bournemouth. And he actually uses, um, you know, the power packs that you get on power drills now. Yeah. So it's like a, a simple battery pack and he, he just took what was an existing technology and he put it onto a wheelchair that was l lightweight but powered. And I just thought, what a great idea. Um, and he's gone straight in. And, you know, this he was worried about him because he said his son was a bit lazy. Um, but his son really got inv in, in, involved in the project and he got really excited by it. And he had two job offers. He he put he put his name down for a master's, but he had two job offers, and he he just ended up saying, right, I'm going to take one of the offers. And it's because he had a really interesting project. It really, you know, there was a need there. You know, you, there wasn't an existing. There's lightweight wheelchairs and there's power drills, <laughs> and he brought the two technologies together. And the gap in the market is, you know people in wheelchairs get tired and and every so often they need you know a little boost to to to, to enable them to have a lead a, a fuller life 100 uh, percent, amazing uh, amazing insights there and tony's building on that like in terms of yourself uh, what was your final major project and um what, can you give some advice in terms of deciding upon the the area the domain the brief yeah well i mean I, I, as i said earlier i mean all i did was i just went around <laughs> It was actually my mate's parents, you know, and it was a bit random. Um, I gave them a, a one, you know, a, a five question questionnaire. Is there a gap in the market where you can, and I gave them it long in advance, you know, go away and think about it. And then one of them came back to me and he said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a doctor in an accident and emergency group. And I have to, when I send an ambulance crew out, some because I was asking, you know, he, 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 I think that he was, he was moaning that obviously ambulance crews, when you get somewhere, you have to, if there's no one there that you can say, can you hold this bag? You know, you have to find, you know, a, a, a retort stand and then you've got to, you know, you don't know how reliable that is. And if it's in, you know, a, a, an awkward place, like on the side of a mountain, 
what do you do? So that's when, you know, he said, what I really need is we have infusion pumps already in hospitals. Why can't this be portable? And then, you know, it went and, and that again, the aha moment for me was, well, there's a gap in the market. And he said, yeah, but if it's got a battery, you don't want it running out. And I went, OK, I get that. And, he, and that's where we, you know, why don't we make, put a clockwork mechanism in there as well as a battery? Amazing. In, and uh, building on that, in terms of uh, the engineering aspects, Omies is asking, as an engineer in the medical industry, is there any urgency in terms of researching and designing products and how someone should deal with that? Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. Is there an urgency? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah the, the guys who have just delivered COVID, yeah. Um, you look how quickly that was done. And there was a lot of engineering and um, a very quick decision making in that. And it's it's part chemistry, obviously, um, but they had to ramp up. They had to really innovate. How are we going to get these supplies? How the, I worked on, you were asking about projects. I worked on the Relenza project, which was for bird flu. And we changed our mentality completely. Instead of having individual devices, we were packing 144 at a time um transit testing them make sure that they could go anywhere else somewhere else in the world and not get damaged but you know absolutely and that that to me is when i think designers really come into their forefront that, that you know like we've got to sort this out now we've had problems you know we were just about to launch a product i can't tell you which one um and we we sent them out to get transit tested because we'd left the packaging to the end um, we discovered that in transit one of the one of one of the components moved so we had to get a solution literally within two months that in that we were so constrained because we'd built all the equipment to assemble the device and we got a solution and out of that solution we got a patent amazing amazing and uh, joseph uh, is building on that in terms of your skills um during your time at university what would you say are the most valuable skills you, you you've learned in terms of helping you get your first design job Final year project. Uh -huh. um, final year project, a passion for what you do. I think being humble because be, I was the only designer at, at Portex and I, I, and I had to kind of learn how to educate the guys on the manufacturing floor and even the engineers who were brilliant engineers, but they weren't designers. And, and I had to learn how to temper my excitement. I was like a puppy, you know, first job. Um, but I, it was a case of just stepping back, understanding people's roles. Um, so, so it's back down to the listening and then looking for that opportunity to leverage your personality. So, you know, for example, I used to go into hospitals um, and, um, you know, I, I, I had a really cheesy three-piece suit that was brown. It was like my interview suit. And, and I wore it the first couple of times. And then one of the nurses, you know, she, she knew what, what I was doing. And she said, um, she said, like, the only people who wear suits in, in hospitals are, are the consultants, doctors, that's the really high up ones, or salesmen. So what you need to do, get a pair of smartish trousers, get a tweed jacket with some leather <laughs> elbow bits on it, wear a slightly scruffy tie, yeah, and get a really shit briefcase. <laughs> and it was hilarious because, and you know, from then on, I could walk into pretty much any ward. I'm here with this doctor to design this product. I need to speak to the patient or I need to see the patient. Um, you know, and, and that's where you, you have to become, and, and, and I don't know if it's something you can be taught, I think it's just mature quickly, <laughs> and, and, and listen to people, and whatever you do, be nice, be nice. Amazing, and I think, uh, Greg, I think that's a fantastic point, uh, or series of points to end on there. So guys, uh, obviously, uh, thanks, thanks, Greg, for taking out your time and joining us tonight. It was, it was a great talk, great Q&A session as well. Thanks for your time and the talk. And for all of the participants, uh, the details were sent to your emails ahead of the talk as well. So definitely feel free to, to read, browse, connect. 
And to conclude, um, you know, keep an eye on your emails for the details of the speak and the links to, to next week's talk as well. So stay well and stay safe. And thank you, guys. Thanks again.